<laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and a hearty welcome to all of you. We appreciate you very, very much your being here for, for what we certainly hope will be the first in a series of annual uh, Wilson Center uh, FICI uh, lectures. Uh, I regret very much that Lee Hamilton, the President and, and uh, Director of the Center, uh, has other meetings, uh, some in this building, some out of the building, but uh, he may be here uh, a little bit later this afternoon. But thank you for being here. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars is the official memorial to the 28th President of the United States. We are a public-private institution. Uh, we raise roughly two-thirds of the funds that uh, are needed to keep this institution going. We do two things. We convene meetings, try and get the right people in the room, a mix of scholars um, and uh, policymakers, people from the private sector, uh, hoping that through their dialogue, better policy can emerge. The second thing we do is that we host, in the course of a year, 150 scholars from all over the world. Uh, at this particular time, I think we have about 82 in residence, and the place is uh, teeming. Our event today, as I indicated, is the first in what we envision to be an annual lecture series organized by the Woodrow Wilson Center in cooperation and partnership with the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FICI. Uh, we are delighted to be partner partnering with FICI in this series, and I want to publicly thank FICI for helping us secure such a distinguished speaker for the first in the series. I also want to acknowledge the presence today of Ambassador Mira Shankar. Um, India is extraordinarily talented ambassador in Washington. In the year and a half that she's been in this town in this present assignment, uh, Madam Ambassador has established herself as one of the city's most effective and respected diplomats. The Wilson Center owes Ambassador Shankar a special debt of thanks uh, since uh, she has lent us her husband, Ajay Shankar, uh, who is currently a public policy scholar at the center and will be with us through the end of the year. Uh, Ambassador Shankar, welcome back to the Wilson Center. This is not your first visit here, and we're very happy to have you here again. Thank you for the wonderful work you're doing to solidify the ties between our two countries. I want now to uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Amit Mitra, uh, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Dr. Mitra is the Secretary General of FICI and is universally recognized as one of the, uh, his country's most influential business leaders. Dr. Mitra has serves on several boards and, and committees uh, created to advise the government of India on some of the most uh, important economic challenges that India faces, infrastructure modernization, competitiveness, civil aviation, energy policy, innovate, innovative financing, public-private partnerships, the list could go on and on. For these services and others, he, is a recipient, he was the recipient two years ago of India's prestigious Padma Shri Award conferred by the President of India. Uh, for the benefit of Ray Vickery, who is sitting here in the front row of the audience, I should also note that Dr. Mitra holds a PhD in economics from Duke University. <laughs> the color of sky is sometimes blue. <laughs> Depends what shade you're talking about if you're from North Carolina. <laughs> Dr. Mitra, um, you are a frequent visitor to the Wilson Center, for which we thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it is nice to welcome you back as such an esteemed friend and a valued partner. Uh, we are extremely excited about our par partnership with Vicki. And we thank you for making this today, event today possible. I'm turning things over to you to introduce our speaker, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you all. Well, I'm somewhat humbled by the uh, introduction. I'm just a, uh, a worker in the process of change in India. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, Honorable Ambassador, uh, Secretary of Finance, very nice to have you with us, sir. Of course, Dr. Hathaway, uh, a great scholar, 
uh, from Woodrow Wilson, and such a distinguished gathering, uh, many of whom I have known over the years. It was honestly a great honor for us to work with the embassy uh, in making uh, this possible with the blessing of the minister, who has a very tight, tight schedule. I'm also very proud to have the former industry secretary, Mr. Ajay Shankar, as the Fiki Woodrow Wilson scholar. No doubt uh, the ambassador has given time for him to spend time in the center. <laughs> and I believe that you're doing a major work on carbon reduction in India uh, over time. And we look forward, Mr. Shankar, for that output. Well, friends, I'm here to introduce the Honorable Minister. Let me submit to you, he was not only finance minister once before, and now the cabinet minister of finance. He was minister for defense. He was minister for commerce and industry. He was minister for external affairs. And many more, which I don't wish to recount, because he has practically held all major ministries as a minister. But what is most interesting to me is wherever he has been, he left behind a legacy, which is very, very critical. I'll give you an example. He was Minister of Defense. And what is the legacy? He was the one who brought in private sector manufacturing into the defense space at level playing field with the defense public sector entities. It was his contribution of one more movement on partnership between private and public. Today, he's initiated, he's initiating fundamental change in Ministry of Finance, which some of you would be interested in. From nowhere, with work quietly done, he's introduced the direct tax code in India. Didn't exist before. He has moved into goods and services tax, moving one more value chain up from VAT without any fuss, and one didn't realize that you're moving up that one more value chain. And most importantly, a massive shift in emphasis, which you'll hear from him yourself, on rural sector emphasis and stimulation of the rural sector, an amazing effort at inclusion with growth. If you look at his budget, you will see this tectonic shift quietly, under-promising and over-performing. <laughs> so friends, it is a great honor for me and for Fiki and Ranjana Khanna is here who's posted in Washington for all of us to have this occasion to work with Woodrow Wilson and thank you, thank you Dr. Hathaway for making this happen. So I would say this is a historic moment for all of us. Thank you very much. It is a great honor for me to request the Honorable Minister to make his very important statement today. I believe you are webcasting this. We are. Televising this. Both. Both. Webcasting now. We are taping it for a subsequent Woodrow Wilson Center television program. Fantastic. And we will bring a book out of this. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Hatri, Mr. Michael von Dilsu, Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center, Dr. Amit Mitro, Secretary General Fiki, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed an honor for me to be here today in Washington at the famous Woodrow Wilson Cent International Center for scholars. I would like to thank Mr. Hamilton, President and Director of the Center, for inviting me to speak before this distinguished gathering. I understand 
that this institute has a long and illustrious tradition of promoting informed dialogue for a better appreciation <laughs> of international issues and developments and to anticipate emerging trends and contribute to formulation of new policies. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you some of my own thoughts on the emerging global economic architecture and about the relationship between our two countries, India and USA. Once in a few decades, it appears as if the world is at crossroad when the path that it chooses to trade becomes critical for progress in the well-being of its people and fundamental changes in the international rules and institutions to guide the process becomes progressive. Neither the process of change nor its outcomes are linear. These are always concerns, uncertainties, and choices to be exercised from competing alternatives and objectives. The process is indeed challenging. Today, we are at one such juncture of our lives. Following the global financial crisis <clears throat> since late 2007, and one of the deepest downturns that the world has witnessed in recent times, we are compelled to rethink some of our traditional principles of economic and financial policy making. For the first time after the Second World War, nations have been forced to come together to explore and discuss the need for collective action the need to regulate finance in a globalized world and the need to reform international economic architecture. When that happens, there is hope. As we meet here today, the world economy is showing visible signs of emerging from the global slowdown. The pace and shape of recovery across countries, both in the developed and the emerging world, is however varied and perhaps uncertain in some instances. At home, we have done better than what was perhaps anticipated. While we have got certain things right, there are others that need our attention, follow-up, both at the international as well as the national levels. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by recollecting some of the lessons and issues that we need to keep in our mind as we collectively find solutions to address them and move towards a new international economy architecture. Foremost, we have seen that makers, that markets with no regulatory supervision are prone to asset price or debt bubbles that lead to cyclical fluctuations in economic activity. Unlike in the past, in the present age of globalization, such fluctuations are more likely to have serious cross-border and economic implications. Governments and central banks therefore have to play a key role in supervising and regulating markets collectively and individually in their respective economies. Secondly, greater attention needs to be given to transmission channels of contagion the hard behavior of investors, 
excessive risk taking during boom years and risk aversion during crises. The efforts to identify and strengthen institutions that are considered too big to fail and too interconnected to fail is part of the effort to limit systematic fallout of contagion. Thirdly, carving speculative activities in the areas of credit and price derivatives, for example, requires proactive domestic oversight and regulation as well as global coordination. Fourthly, unfettered growth of the financial sector can have dangerous implications for the real economy as was seen during the recent crisis, when the financial sector crisis spilled into the real sector. Financial sector innovation should serve the objective of the real sector development and promote financial stability. Finally, for sustained growth and stability, global structural, structural imbalances have to be addressed sooner rather than later. The huge buildup of reserves in some countries and deficits elsewhere, massive trade surpluses in some, deep trade deficits in others are not sustainable. More nations need to come forward and share the responsibility to contribute to the global prosperity. The critical gaps in international policy making and regulation in risk management and international development cooperation need to be bridged. There is a need for pursuing effective international cooperation and strengthening institutional mechanisms that support and sustain equitable global development. International financial institutions need to reflect in their functioning the realities on the ground. Indeed, if there is one lesson to be drawn from our recent experiences, it is that we need to be vigilant in tracking economic developments at the global level as well as in our respective domestic constituencies. Even as we make progress on several fronts, including on the issue of the global economic monitoring and governance, the question is how much should we regulate and where do we draw the line? If we do not regulate economic activity at all, we can have poor people getting trapped in debt and a repeat of the crisis of 2007. On the other hand, if we overregulate, we will kill innovation and harm economic growth. The solution to these dilemmas is not easy. The US has tried to address some of these concerns with its new Dodd-Frank legislation. We in India are also exploring new ideas in financial regulation that protect the vulnerables but allow markets to flourish. There is a lot that can be learned from the best practices in one part of the world to guide policy response in other. At this point, I must draw your attention to a rather unique developmental approach by India in the recent years. We are not waiting any longer for the phenomenon of trickle-down to happen with our significant growth trajectory. Instead, India has embarked on one of the largest efforts in history for direct entitlement of the poor and massive asset creation in the rural sector. It is also rolling out 100,000 IT Kishoks with an eye on e-governance, e-education, e-health, telemedicine, and as many as 83,635 have already been rolled out in the rural India. We have passed a right to education bill allocated 
24.3 billion dollar in the last three financial years for the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act to provide jobs to the jobless and 10.7 billion US dollar on Bharat Nidman project for rural power, road, drinking water, telecom, irrigation and housing. Our substantive GDP growth will be accompanied by direct inclusion of the underprivileged who will in turn contribute to our rising growth trajectory. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the current phase of globalization has shrunk the world and made boundaries between countries irrelevant. At one level, it has reduced us to a single entity, such as developments in one part of the global entity have pronounced implications on the other part. This crisis has shown us that the pitfalls of an unquestioning dependence on the functions of the liberal markets to sustain and enhance human well-being. Yet, we have also seen how these very markets have been the means to bring unprecedented prosperity to a large part of the world over an extended period of time. They have opened up real possibilities for many of us in the developing world to make genuine progress in addressing some of our persistent problems of poverty, livelihood, health, education, and security. I believe that globalization has the potential to benefit us all through greater trade, more specialization, and the flow of capital from where there is a glut, and the returns to capital are low to where there is a shortage of capital and the returns to capital are high. The United States of America, more than any other country, has demonstrated to the world that can be achieved by having an open economy and keeping the channels of trade and business open. There is lesson in this for all of us. Indeed, we need to make move on and have an early conclusion of the Doha <coughs> round of trade talks. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the designation of the G20 as the premier forum for international economic cooperation has brought together advanced and emerging market economies at the same table on the equal footing. This has been a major step in the direction of improving global governance and shared responsibility for larger public good. We welcome this and commend the U.S. and the other developed nations in taking and supporting this state. Indeed, it is not surprising that the G20 could concert the decisive response to enable the world economy to move on the path to recovery. G20 spearheaded a commitment to implement the coordinated macroeconomic policies, including fiscal expansion to the extent of 5 trillion US dollar and the use of unconventional monetary policy instruments. It took the initiative to significantly enhance financial regulations, notably by the establishment of the Financial Stability Board and strengthen the international financial institutions, including the expansion of the resources and the improvement of precautionary lending facilities. We need to persist with and strengthen this mechanism as we move forward to create a more dynamic and equitable economic architecture for global trade and sustained growth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that economics and economic relations are important, but it is essential to recognize that these relationships are embedded in a certain geopolitical reality. We have to be realistic and manage global geopolitics to create the preconditions for economic prosperity. Nations working together, both regionally and globally, 
can become critical forces for geopolitical peace in the world and for creating the social and political preconditions without which no nation can grow and prosper. There are dangers and risks of disruption in the world that we have to be attentive to at all times. Consider the Straits of Malacca. More ships pass through this corridor carrying goods and freight than any other comparable sea corridor in the world. If a war or terrorist attack disrupt this trade route, the entire global economy will be plunged into crisis. This is an area of interest not only to the neighboring nations such as India, Indonesia, Singapore and Malaysia, but to the whole world. Managing political tensions, creating multiple stakeholders with interest in peace are essential to prevent such disruptions and political turmoil. Given our shared interest in peace and stability in Asia, India and the United States can work together to promote this objective. The friendship between our nations is built on deep shared values and the commitment to democracy and secularism. We are both multiracial and multicultural societies that have found strength in our diversity and in our convictions. In addition, we now have important economic interconnections based on trade, investment, and the movement of people. This has led to increasing warmth between our nations. With gradual economic reforms pursued through a broad-based domestic political consensus so essential in democracies, India is now an open, competitive market economy whose engagement and integration with the global economy has been growing rapidly. Trade between India and the United States has more than doubled between 2004 and 2008, with both trade in goods and services being broadly balanced. As Indian companies seek to position themselves better in the global marketplace, they have invested over $25 billion between 2004 and 2009 in U.S., creating jobs and prosperity, just as U.S. companies have been doing in India. India's growth is primarily domestic demand-driven and not export-led, with the Indian economy expected to grow between 8 to 10 percent over the coming decades, the opportunities for business engagement with India will multiply manifold. Sustained high growth will catapult India into one of the three largest economies in the coming decades. The Indian economy will be one of the nodes of global economic momentum and stability. The nuclear agreement between our nations and what it can do to it alleviate the demand for greater energy and the electricity is a significant symbol of our collaboration. The 10th of October 2008, when our two nations signed this agreement for the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, must go down as an important day in history. In October 2009, the Indian government announced its intention to set up the light water reactor best plants in cooperation with the U.S. at Chan Mithi Breed in western India and at Kovabad in southern India. While this has created further scope for business interaction between our two nations, it has also improved the possibility of lighting up more homes and bringing water and energy to the Indian farmers. There is also a lot of scope for collaboration between India and the U.S. in the area of education. Both India and the United States have comparably large higher educational system. In India, there are 15.5 million students. In U.S., there are 19.7 million students. There is also a lot of flow of students between the two nations, though this is largely in one direction from India to U.S. In 2008, 
There were 3,146 American students in India and around 100,000 Indian students in U.S. Academic interaction between nations is a source of soft power relations between nations. It builds the flow of knowledge and technology and contributes to peace. I'm glad there is so much academic inter <coughs> interaction between our nations, but the scope for building up more is immense. I do want India to be a hub of global education and to have many more American students coming to India for education. Indian students and their families are today hungry for more knowledge and education. America is a world leader in terms of higher education, research, and can contribute to our efforts. Cooperation between India and the United States in this sector will be mutually beneficial, building, expanding, and durable links between our people, which will be the connecting issues of our relationship. Friends, we live today in a small world. There is need for greater international cooperation to manage global challenges. These cannot be tackled by any single country alone. A strong partnership between India and the United States would be a vital in this process. In this context, let me mention how delighted we are at the prospect of welcoming President Obama to India next month. We recall his hospitality to India last November when, when our Prime Minister Dr. Munmohan Singh was made the first state guest President Obama administration. <coughs> President Obama had said that the U.S.-India partnership would be one of the defining relationship in the 21st century. I share this sentiment and that our country is ready to take this friendship forward. I am sure that his visit will strengthen cooperation between India and the United States and lay out a vision for our strategic partnership based on our shared values and our shared interest. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the patience shown to me. Well, Minister, Minister, I know I speak for not only everybody in this room, but those who are watching this live and those who will be watching this um, in expressing our deep appreciation for a very insightful and comprehensive set of remarks. Um, your remarks remind me how entirely appropriate it is that um, the G20, including India, has superseded the G7 as the forum for the discussion, the serious discussion of global financial and economic affairs. Um, they also uh, brought home to me how, for all the differences in our two countries and our two economies, our levels of economic development, how similar are the domestic economic challenges both of us face. Um, so I do thank you. Uh, we're honored to have you, and um, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, the minister has agreed to take um, some questions from the audience. Um, before we move into that portion of the um, hour, however, I also simply want to echo the comments made by uh, Mike Van Dusen earlier. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be in this new partnership uh, with FICI. Um, and with uh, Dr. Mitra and Ranjana uh, and their team, both in India and in, in Washington. Uh, we place great stock uh, in the value of this partnership, and we look forward to a most productive uh, a partnership together. Um, as the um, holder of degrees from two other Wake Forest, uh, two other North Carolina universities, I'm a little bit disturbed about this focus on Duke, but we'll let that pass. <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, with your permission, we'll go into the question and answer uh, period. 
We have microphones on either side of the room. Um, I will uh, recognize you. I would ask that you wait until we get uh, microphones to you, that you briefly introduce yourself, and that you very briefly uh, frame your question for the minister. Uh, Goyal will go first here. We're going to go to Ray second, and we'll go third there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Great uh, evaluation of the Indian economy. Raghubir uh, Goyal, India Globe in Asia today. My question is that I keep asking everywhere, including the White House and the State Department, what, when India is going to get the United Nations Security Council seat, largest democracy, but China, the largest communist country, is there, but India is not there. Finally, what message, sir, do you have for President Obama? What India is ex expecting from his visit, and what do you have message as far as the Indian economy is concerned, despite many countries were in trouble, but India was doing better than many countries? That seemed like about three questions. Um, <laughs> Mr. Minister, we'll, we'll give you uh, permission to pick and choose. <laughs> in fact, so far the Security Council's permanent membership is concerned. I do hope, as and when, the expanded Security Council, along with the reforms, general reforms of the United Nations take place, India's claim for being the permanent member of the Security Council will be considered and accepted. In respect of the visit of President Obama, I have outlined as he himself mentioned during the visit of Dr. Manmohan Singh, Indian Prime Minister last year, that our relationship is a defining moment in history so far this century is concerned. If these two great countries, great democracies, believe her in diversities and pluralities, can work together, it would not only be better for the people belonging to these countries, it would have a tremendous impact all over the world. I think I was asked to choose two questions, and these two <laughs> questions I choose. Thank you. Right. Mr. Minister, uh, Ray Vickery, uh, public policy scholar here at uh, I think your microphone. Yeah. Mr. Minister. Better. Ray Vickery, a former uh, public policy scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center and senior director at Albright uh, Stonebridge. Uh, I want to pick up on your remarks having to do with the international economic imbalances uh, and particularly uh, the questions of uh, exchange rates and uh, restrictions on currency flows. Uh, this morning the Financial Times uh, reports that some at the Reserve Bank of India are advocating restrictions on uh, foreign institutional investment into India on the grounds that it uh, creates uh, perhaps a further imbalance and inflation. And they also uh, refer to you as uh, saying that you did not think that those, um, uh, those kinds of restrictions are necessary or appropriate. And I'm wondering if you might shed some further light on uh, your views and those of the government of India in this regard. In fact, so far the foreign institutional investment and FDI to India are concerned. I do not consider it is going to be too volatile at the present situation. But definitely, it is the responsibility of the central bank of any country to watch this situation and as and when it is necessary to intervene appropriately. But I myself stated in response to a question before I came here that I do not consider that situation has arisen in Indian economy today. The inflow of FII or FTI has not distorted the market sentiments and therefore there is no question of putting any card. Thank you. In the middle here in the third row.
Mr. Minister, I'm Dev Carr from Global Financial Integrity. I'm the lead economist. I'm looking at illicit financial flows from India. I was wondering whether you could provide a synopsis of India's efforts to trace illicit money abroad, for example, India's relationship with uh, Switzerland and the double tax, uh, tax avoidance agreement, and where that is at present, and how successful do you think India would be in trying to get the illicit flows back to India? So for the initiatives which we have taken, as you know, we have avoidance of double taxation agreement with 78 countries. Also, we have exchange of information agreement with certain entities and regions like Bahama, Virginia Islands, etc. Up to now, we have written to each country with which we have avoidance of double taxation agreement to undergo an amendment to amend the relevant clause where the exchange of information between countries are enshrined. The process of dialogue is going on. With Switzerland, we have been able to complete the negotiations. Both sides have agreed. But we are awaiting the ratification of this agreement as per the Swiss laws. With the ratification, the date of operation will be announced. In respect of four or five other countries, we have been able to finalize this negotiation and some entities, it has been completed. And in respect of the others, it is in the process. As and when we get the information, it would be easier for the <coughs> taxation departments to raise the tax demands on them. But obviously, it would be prospective. It cannot be given a retrospective effect. And we are at it. Thank you. Dennis. Uh, Dennis Cook, a uh, scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, India has had an admirable growth rate, development rate, but it also has a fairly high inflation rate. And I'm wondering if you could comment, share with us uh, your views on how well the government is doing uh, in dealing with inflation. I do agree that there is an inflationary pressure in the system. And you will have to agree with me when we have massive financial expansions. We cannot expect to have non-inflationary impact in the economy at all. But I'm more concerned about the inflationary pressure on food items. We have taken steps to improve the supply side by providing easy import of goods which are in short supply. On the demand side, the latest revision of the appropriate rates, repo rates and reverse repo rates by 50 and 25 basis points have created a situation where a part of the excess liquidity will be mopped up by the Central Bank, Reserve Bank of India. Here we are proceeding carefully because resorting to strict monetary policy and creating a liquidity crisis will affect the growth. Therefore, we are accepting the policy through which we can strike a balance so that the growth is not retarded and at the same time inflationary pressure is being reduced. I do hope it would be possible for us to do so and we can end the financial year with an inflationary rate around 6%. Thank you. 
Paul Eckert of the Reuters News Agency. You mentioned in global imbalance as being, as being unsustainable, and you are here for the IMF meetings that, uh, in which, about which some people are describing a looming currency war around the world. What is India's view about the, uh, the competitive devaluation threats that we have seen in, across uh, the globe at this time? Thank you. In respect of the currency valuation, my approach is that we should try to engage the countries in negotiation and build up a consensus through which the matter could be resolved. It cannot be resolved through confrontation, but through consensus it would be possible and we should engage in the process of building up consensus. Thank you. The lady in the middle, yes. Then we're going to go all the way to the woman in the back. Uh, Mr. Minister, maybe while we're waiting, I, sh I should ask your permission. We got stated, started a little bit late. Uh, may we continue just for a few more questions? I maybe I should ask the ambassador. <laughs> I am afraid. I think we may have to, we may take one or two more. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Pranita Saxena from the Center for Global Development. And I just wanted to call attention to two points that you raised. You um, appreciated that there were, that you appreciated the U.S. and India for both fostering open channels for trade and business. So my question is, um, how would you factor migration into the mix of creating an appropriate environment for trade and business, especially from Bangladesh and Nepal and other areas? Um, secondly, you also called for bilateral and international cooperation in terms of um, creating an environment for f discussing financial stability. And so my question is, for that, what do you foresee as a useful um, relationship at the bilateral and, and international level that India would like to see in terms of climate finance? Climate. Thank you. So far, the climate finance is concerned. I do believe even if CCC is the appropriate forum where the climate finance should be dealt with, if we entrust too many subjects on one institution, I am afraid the focus may be lost. In fact, in St. Andrews, G20 Finance Minister's Conference, this issue it was immediately before the Copenhagen summit. This issue was debated and our view was quite clear. First, let us wait the outcome of Copenhagen summit. Now Cancun is going to take place. But one aspect I would like to suggest that burden sharing will have to be done and it must be proportionate. And at the same time, capabilities of the countries concerned are also to be kept in view. But the overall objective should be ensured that energy is being available to the energy-starved countries at the affordable cost. Otherwise, the climate change approach and objective will be frustrated because we should not forget one aspect of pollution is that poverty, deprivation, and sufferings. Therefore, we shall have to strike a balance. So far, the financing aspect is concerned. It could be done in that way. And in respect of the other aspects, let UNFCC see, should arrive at a definitive conclusion and international commitment is there. And we should not go on shifting from venue to venue, place to place. All the way back. Good evening, Mr. Finance Minister. Namrita Brar from NDTV. So ahead of uh, President Barack Obama's landmark visit to India, 
have the issues regarding outsourcing being resolved because this has been a problem with both the countries of late? And secondly, what are the concrete financial partnerships that you would like to see with the U.S.? You as in India on a financial side would like to see from U.S. after this visit. Thank you. In any growing relationship between countries and the partners, there will be issues which are to be addressed through dialogue, through discussions, through negotiations. Because this is the growing relationship and there is a dynamism in the relationship. Therefore, it cannot be a situation where all issues will be resolved at one time. The essence of the relationship is to have the desire to dialogue and through the process of dialogue to resolve the outstanding issues. Therefore, the issues of outsourcing, the issues of financial relationship and arrangements, all these are being looked into and the appropriate forum, there are various appropriate forums to carry on this dialogue in a regular structured manner between India and USA. All these forums are activized and put into operation. So far, President's visit is concerned. It will not only be uh, important, outstanding visit, it will also, as President himself pointed out, that it would be a defining moment in history. And it cannot be categorized in one, two, three, four items. The overall message would be that the two large democracies, one of the largest populous countries of the world and largest functional democracy, another is the one of the oldest democracy, believing in pluralism, multiracialism, multiculture, they are coming together to convey the message that in democracy there should be diversities and we should not oppose diversity, we should celebrate diversity that strengthen. And I do hope President Obama's visit to India will convey to the world that message very clearly and distinctly. Thank you. Uh, I'm getting various signals that uh, we need to break it off. Um, uh, Minister, Minister um, thank you so much for getting the inaugural Wilson Center FICI annual lectural series off to such a good start. Um, Ambassador, um, thank you for your cooperation and your embassy team's cooperation. Mr. Minister, I understand that you have moved beyond the Ministry of External Affairs, but you should know you've got a terrific ambassador here, all the same. Uh, if now everyone will join me in expressing our appreciation to the minister. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I meant what I said about the ambassador.